the year, 2004, the date, Tuesday 30th of November, a time of crisis. George W. Bush has recently been re-elected to his second term of President of the United States, and Tony Blair is scampering around, digging up the South Lawn at the White House, frantically searching for WMDs. But most importantly, House MD Episode 3, Occam's Razor, has just been released. And that's what we're both here to talk about today, an episode of House 15 Years After the Fact. So, um, hi, my name's Harvey, and this is my co-host. Introduce yourself, Gareth. Yeah, um, I'm Gareth, um, or Gaz, as they call me. Um, I'm here to watch some House MD for the first time. Absolutely. So, as you can imagine, 15 years after the fact for an episode, quite late, but... I'd uh, watched House uh, back in the days when it actually aired, but recently um, Gaz decided to start watching the show. And so we obviously were talking about it and we thought, well, no one really talks about House that much these days. So what would be more interesting than having a podcast where we recorded those kind of meandering conversations while we watch an episode? Well, um, I'm I'm a complete virgin to this. <laughs> um Occam's Razor, obviously, a philosophical concept um, introduced by William of Occam. Um, <laughs> lived in Surrey, I think. Uh, I think I passed the town once when I was cycling around. Did you know Nothing Occam's really... first name or did you look that up? No, I knew his name. Um, I did study philosophy at university some many moons ago, so uh, I am aware of William of Occam. I might be wrong. Maybe it's like Jeremy of Ockham or something. I've just misremembered. (laughs) Well, this is one of the, uh, like a trend of house episodes, which names itself after like a logical method or like a belief system and then spends the episode exploring that belief system or logical method. I think there's a few others. I remember the Socratic method being one. Um, Yeah. Although none spring to mind now, now that I've actually said that as a running theme, maybe they dropped it after the Socratic method. Well, my Wikipedia research tells me that, you know, <laughs> ideas about logic would not not be alien to the creator of House, uh, Mr. David Shaw. Um, and so I'm guessing he would know all about these things. And <laughs> these will be explained very laboriously with meticulous detail in this episode <laughs> no so the um so the system uh what we're going to do is we basically have an episode running in the background and we sort of chat about it as things come up and we edit out the boring bits but uh basically yeah we're gonna you know if you're a fan of house and you like hearing people talk about house we're gonna watch episode three we're gonna chat about it and we're gonna um see if anything interesting crops up yep and my fresh perspective on these things is gonna illuminate all sorts of things that Harvey's um, dementia adult brain will not pick up (laughs) immediately or you know he's been he's watched it he's obsessed over it he's probably looking at the bigger picture whereas I'm kind of going oh this is quite alien why is house being a douchebag here or why is Cameron doing this or you know all these things all these beautiful little intricate things I've quite, never seen before. It's quite interesting going back and watching the series because um, like, there's a lot of stuff set up in the early episodes, which you kind of take as read. But I forget that at one point House was actually setting up these kind of tropes that would continue for eight seasons. Wow. And wouldn't really develop that much. Like, which, I mean, I'm sure you noticed during the episode and hopefully we'll spot as we go. And I do wonder when that stops happening, because obviously there's 24 episodes of development. Um, Mm. I'm I'm interested to see when kind of everything's cemented in place. I I think David Shaw, being a meticulous mind, (laughs) um, will have mapped all of this out over eight seasons pre, you know, he's premeditated this. Yeah. Um, And I guess he's, you know, he's mapped it all out. He's got it all in his head. He's... You know, he's spoken with Brian Singer, who may or may not be a bit dodgy, <laughs> um, um, and said, hey, look, Brian, this is how I want to do it. I've mapped out eight seasons, and Brian's like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, and then uh, they press the execute button on that, and it all ran across. But, yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, where the tropes kind of set in. 
Mm. And what are the tropes in reaction to? Because obviously it's a medical procedural drama. And is it going to follow the tropes of medical procedural of the genre? Or is it going to... Is it going to deviate? Is it going to... Is it going to subvert our expectations? Is it going to jump the shark? Is it going to... Well, yes, it definitely does that. Well, Spoiler I don't know alert. that. <laughs> really? Yeah, classic uh, house style. Obviously, they open with the uh, with the cold open, where somebody is ill. It kind of looks a bit like Hayden Christensen, <laughs> or like a kind of photocopied version, a facsimile of him. That kind of they pressed his head against the <laughs> photocopier, and that's what came out. <laughs> yeah, he does sort of look like a young Patrick Bateman. Oh, that's a good reference. He's um, well, you 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 sort of were saying before we started recording this that he's like that like the young people are terribly written in this do you want to do you want to go into i think david shaw hates young people <laughs> why because he makes them seem so vacuous and stupid in comparison to his more complex characters i think the younger they are the more stupid they get he has like a quotient <laughs> which kind of works i mean when he's writing script for a baby i mean they don't have to really do much no, that's true. <laughs> I, do, I do remember, I mean, we'll get to it at some point, but I do know that in this episode, the uh, the two are engaged in college. Yeah. Which, which seems is... to be a way to make them seem as like, you know, bad, poor decision makers as possible. Yeah. And also the room is now suffering from a like Richter scale nine earthquake <laughs> yeah. in a really. And if you look at the establishing shot, it's supposed to be a robust sandstone building. <laughs> And they just kind of just been <laughs> supposedly <laughs> rocking the entire edifice of the building <laughs> with their sexual intercourse, which is really worrying. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I like, yeah. I mean, I've I've got to give it to them. They last longer than I do. Oh Jesus! But it yeah. is, <laughs> of course, a fifteen second scene. But it is a yeah. It is a fucking insane opening in terms of them <laughs> having sex. But well, that, the sim- that then becomes a theme later. Well, I mean, they make it yeah. so obvious because then later in the episode, there is kind of like a bit of sexual tension. Mm. It's all connected. The thing that gets me is that she that goes, oh, damn, I am so good. It's just such a throwaway line. Of, <laughs> but I'm not that good. And it's like, he's now dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just mean, there's such, clearly something wrong with him. Such she- shit dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm damn I know I'm I'm not that good but, 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 uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I do th- I do think a problem with the patients and I this is just the nature of like shows like this where there are so many characters popping in mm. but none of the patients really like they, they they always I mean they're usually trying to prove a point or like explore a theme that like mm. they're kind of saying tropes and like they're not really characters. They're just like I'm still sticking with my thesis that um, he hates young people. <laughs> I think David Shaw hates young people. He did write this episode, and also Brian Singer directed this episode, which is surprising to me with the room shaking, insane uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> setup. I'm going with the simplest explanation. Um, for this, which the is Occam's. obviously Occam's Razor, <laughs> which is there was some sort of earthquake in the Princeton area while they were having sex, and that resulted in the insane establishing shot. Maybe it's like a subline in David Shaw's script or something, I don't know. And there we go, we move on to our uh, first clinic scene. Yes. This one involves House giving uh, a monologue to everyone. Oh yeah, so that they don't, so that they don't um, want him as the doctor. Yeah, I, th- I think this this scene, like, definitely, especially this episode, establishes the antagonism between yes. uh, House and Cuddy a bit more. Because, because uh, uh, in the in the earlier episodes, he was sort of he didn't like 
being um, like he just didn't like doing clinic duty. Yeah. But I think this episode definitely um, establishes like that there is actual like an antagonism that House and Cuddy are constantly trying to one up each other. Yes. And I think it brings a bit more of a character to Cuddy, like because she plays into it. Like she's definitely she's like in a position of power, but she's like not above using really cheap or borderline like borderline like childish tactics, especially when you're the dean of medicine, just to make House do his job. Like in most circumstances, House would have been fired by now, which I think is a well known fact. But he's so brilliant at his job. Yeah, you could not get rid of him. And that's I think that's what makes Cuddy like a particularly good. Um, like authority character is that she's at least like interesting they could have just made her extremely serious just be like oh house no i won't do that and like for house to prove her wrong well he he, i think also um maybe he's always bringing her down to his level so cuddy is always being pushed into house's level of social interaction and so he's like okay i'll just play the same game as you house Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, you mean in the sense that, like, if Wilson was trying to have a nice man contest, yeah, that she would play into that as well. <laughs> yeah, um, she's incredibly petty, but quite, yeah, in a lot of ways, very petty. <laughs> but it seems like there's a big subtext between them from my first impressions. Yeah. Um, and like speaking of Wilson at this point, I still don't think. Yeah, well, Wilson, Wilson and House. Actually, this episode ends starts with Wilson with House suspicious that Wilson just wants him to help the patient because he's being nice. Yeah, which like the the show is really still struggling to show Wilson being nice as like an interesting <laughs> facet of his personality. Yeah, I think later on it definitely establishes the like self-destructive element of the niceness which house yeah. brings out of him but and uh, up to this point like it, i swear the the pilot and this both start with house and wilson talking about a patient that wilson shouldn't really even know about but for some reason wilson is like invested in house helping this person well it's following that sherlock holmes trope which is you mm. know a case comes to wilson mm. uh to Watson, I guess, um, and then that is referred on to Sherlock Holmes, and it's that kind of, you know, Sherlock Holmes setup that they're u- utilizing in these earlier episodes. Um, and Watson is seen as like a reasonable guy, well adjusted, um, and in the same way Sherlock Holmes is flawed, but ingenious in the way that he can use medicine as a way to solve problems well that is his job but um uh, well that was a bit innocuous wasn't it (laughs) well the 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 team the team definitely play more of a watson role going forward i don't particularly remember wilson bringing cases forward that to that extent okay but um but but i also think that wilson house interaction at the start is just to establish like because because wilson is trying to like trick him into doing it and house even then says like oh you know why i'm going to take this case which is because it's interesting that's what i mean about like the kind of um like house md tropes being set up like it's still being set up that like oh house only does things because you know they're interesting he's not a doctor that like goes after the human element he goes after the rubik's cube element yeah he's always looking for the mystery Mm. in a case low blood pressure wasn't it and um oh, uh, the even symptoms. the symptoms that interested him was the fact there was low blood pressure but uh the iv fluids weren't boosting the blood pressure um okay. but now we're into the proper differential diagnosis trademark um <laughs> uh section so they've got all these symptoms and mm-hmm. they've got to try and figure out oh there's something else i wanted to discuss about our Oh yeah, the yeah. the bit in the clinic scene, as well. I think that is a nice moment, which kind of like House does a nice thing for her, but only because it's going to be antagonistic to authority. Mm. Which yeah. is which is quite a nice character moment. Like House is being nice, but you can't tell why he's being nice. Yeah, like he's not. You're really... expecting an ulterior motive. Hmm. 
which I I don't know if, in this episode if that is ever like you never know whether or not House is like doing things just for the for the sake of it, like if he's actually ever just being nice because he wants to be nice. Yeah. Also, another trope that I've noticed in the past two episodes is Cameron being awkward around patients. Oh, really? She's just weird around patients. She'll just make weird remarks. Like, <laughs> <"Rawr."> <laughs> Well, kind of, it, especially in this episode, it does feel like um, Cameron and Chase are definitely seem to be on the same side. Like, they're kind of, yeah. like, just going with the flow, whereas Foreman is definitely, like, the the standout one. Yeah, he doesn't want house to like you said you know it's not bad you know house thinks outside the box and sometimes foreman says well thinking outside the box isn't a good idea mm. we need to do things by the book people <laughs> the book that i read <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> well it's very strange because chase and cameron really champion the way that he like thinks outside the box and comes up with decisions yeah. and yet like and foreman is the one saying oh that's insane which which is like a good character establishment but like cameron in this is really optimistic about the way house thinks but like there are times when cameron is like you're disgusting that you're even like asking us to do that so i i don't know if that's kind of if that's an establishing thing or they make her slowly over time realize that he's too insane but it does feel at the moment that like cameron and chase like don't really stand out i mean aside yeah. from being like weirdly awkward around patients <laughs> Cameron is yeah. the one that's awkward around patience. I think um, Chase is kind of the trope of the kind of, you know, medical procedural doctor mm. in front of the patients. It's very much more the written as a charismatic character. Mm. Um, and also, there's mild kind of weird, maybe racism in this with the ghetto euphemism thing. <laughs> being used so overtly but yeah i did ma that's a weird aging it's aged weirdly i guess in comparison to now yeah watching watching this again there's lots of um yeah like it's not something that you would you would like say like no i don't mean in terms of even offensiveness it's such a like mm. weird way to get like yeah that's it, it's it. very it's clunky just very it's extremely blunt. clunky to bring back to the fact that foreman's black <laughs> I don't know. It, I wouldn't say it's like yeah. the most like elegant. <laughs> yeah, maybe I was a bit too strong saying it was racist. I don't know. Maybe we're opening a can of worms and you can edit it, edit it out later. I think. <laughs> well, they go straight from that to the uh, to the oh, it's like the like oh we saw the sex in the opening yeah. about how the woman's saying like oh you know maybe I put this guy in the hospital through sex, and mm -hmm. then that's kind of connected to oh. Cameron's got a bit of a thing over Chase because she's yeah. a lady who yeah. can have sex. Bit of sexual <laughs> politics in there now. Absolutely. Now discussing the power plays that happen between men and women allegedly. Absolutely. Which, but, but especially like going back and watching this, it's um. Mm. I mean, you know, obviously knowing where Chase and Cameron eventually end up as well, but it's um, it's interesting seeing like Chase and Foreman talking about Cameron like in that way separately. Yeah. Like it's it, it kind of it feels like they're strangers that have just met. Yeah. And they're like talking about someone behind their back, like, you know, because they don't know who wants to have sex with Cameron, what they think of Cameron. And it's um yeah, it's quite interesting going back and like, you know, seeing that this was established because after a few seasons you get used to these people all knowing each other and it is interesting like how these things were established in yeah. that way. He's trying to drive Foreman into the ground with testing and obsessing over the case. He wants to mould Foreman into a house of his own. Mm. Which is a trap that, that Foreman falls instantly into. It's like a, it's a small house, like a, like a mini house or a protege house is the unit of description, like a bungalow or a flat. Is that one of those ghetto euphemisms? No. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's a smaller version of house. A bungalow? Or is it a flat? <laughs> <laughs> He's creating a little flat. Yeah, it's it's a b b <laughs> bungalow MD. <laughs> oh, is, is that Metroid he's playing there? <clears throat> that Game Boy Advance SD? I can't tell. 
It, it is. It is. Oh, fantastic. Well, this is, uh, uh, this is this is the part of the episode where the parents appear. There's also, oh, can I just say, as yeah. a little factoid, mm-hmm. the um, patient who's playing on the Game Boy Advance SD is um, in Mad Men. She plays a um, secretary, a recurring character. Fantastic. But, all right, anyway, sorry about that. Had her, to career, her career continued past this. I'm very happy for her. Indeed. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, the parents come in, and there's this weird. I, I don't know why the parents hate hate the um hate the girlfriend. I know they're protective over their son, but it does seem extremely forced. I think it's probably like the weakest part of the episode. Yeah, they seem to like you know think like oh he's she's giving him drugs, and it's like uh, were parent are parents like this in America? <laughs> Like, I just, the the entire reason that they hate her is just so strange. Cuckoo in the nest, yeah. trying to subvert, subvert their authority, trying to take over and look after him when they know what's best. It's a trope from medical procedural dramas where there's a tension between the um, spouse or lover of the character who is ill and the f- mother and father or family. Mm. So... Yeah, it is pretty weak. Oh, Chase has spilt some coffee on purpose to get Cameron's attention. <laughs> That's not weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is yeah. So there's the this is the the sex subplot mm. between Cameron and Chase, which yeah. is um, I don't I don't seem. I mean, it, it is it is built up over season one, and all credit like it doesn't just go nowhere. Hmm. But it's uh, it's extremely clunky to start with. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm going to describe yeah. sex in a medical context and make it seem very very raunchy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the th- the thing the thing I at least like gives what I like about this scene at least, although it is a bit like <laughs> weird, is that um you know it does at least give some bite to Cameron. In that, you know, you saw her disagreeing with Foreman about it, thinking it was disgusting. But then behind his back, like while in private, she does like test it out to take advantage of it. And it doesn't just make Cameron seem like an incredibly soppy character. Like she does a harmless thing that is, you know, really manipulative. And uh, and in a way proves Foreman's point as well, which um, I don't know if that's David Chase <laughs> Trying to prove a David point Chase that women is... have power like that, or it's, it's like David at least a character Shaw. moment. David Chase. David Shaw. Chase is the creator of The Sopranos. Oh, true. Too many Davids. Or David Shaw. I don't know if yeah. it's David Shaw like trying to prove a weird point. Maybe this is like his. Um, he de- it, there's definitely a thing about House early on where it definitely focuses a lot on, like, sex and race and like uses all these like clunky. <laughs> like weird ways to explore that like in the first episode where house is like talking about like how foreman has street smarts i don't oh, know yeah. if they're trying to prove like i don't know if they're just trying to show a diverse of car a diverse cast and like focus on them as if they're character traits because i definitely mm. think in a modern show they would have like a diverse cast but they wouldn't focus on them but house md like seems to want to focus on them like they're like interesting things to explore yeah it's an interesting one, and maybe from our perspective, we kind of don't see it in no. our time. Mm. Fourteen years hence, 15. don't see it. Fifteen, Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah. Um, look, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange one. Mm. Um, maybe what we see as a sledgehammer in our time is a fine sculptor's chisel (laughs) in theirs yeah because i i at the time i was like so young while watching this and now i've watched it so much later on it seems really clunky but i don't know if at the time this is like oh my god this is like really exploring things that haven't been explored before they okay so we're getting to the point where the patient has been injected with this stuff to anesthetize him and then we go and do a lumbar puncture to get some blood some bone marrow out mm-hmm. of him and it, if you think about it in a particular way it looks very grotesque 
<laughs> and Foreman just behind, like yeah. below the pelvis shot as well. It's not it's not a good look. Yeah, Foreman's Brian fist Singer. is out of shot. We don't know what's going on. <laughs> and and the patient is grimacing. Well, Foreman, but, Foreman look, in what, the come, scene. This scene is so strange because of the way that Foreman, like, well, this guy is like, I'm not sure if Foreman's talking really calmly about what's going to happen to relax him or just because Foreman is completely psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm because he's being shaped into a little flat or bungalow MD. <laughs> I think it's psychotic, but there you go. Yeah, because he's so he's so like you know concerned about the patient's well being, and then he's like not going. Oh, I hope you're all right, mate. <laughs> he's no. just going. I'm going to insert this into your spine, and I'm going to extract something out of it. <laughs> Are you ready? Oh, Cuddy versus House Round Three. There we go. Well, what what I like as well about the scene where like. Because how she breaks the the chain of house trying to piss her off is that she involves Wilson, yeah, which is quite a cruel thing to do. Because I know that she's telling House that oh you know I know what you're doing and I'm gonna like, you know, inconvenience other people as a way to get around that. Because Wilson's a nice guy, mm. like Wilson doesn't need to be disturbed over this. But like Cuddy just uses weaponizes him, <laughs> just completely the throws him thing... under the bus. The other key line in that is that she says, uh, you're already miserable. And it's like, oh, how miserable is he? Um, yeah, well, we, we do, you know, I mean... Do we find that out? We do We do slowly get to see how miserable House is. I, I think House MD genuinely, like, handles misery quite well. Like, I think, like... um. When most shows would show like someone drinking or just being angry, I think like House will just go home and just watch telly all night and just mm. take Vicodin. And I do think that like over the course of the series, like House being a miserable character is kind of like shown in quite a visceral way. It mm. definitely makes House stand out as a character. He's not just like, I don't think that he's just sad on the surface. I think that, you know, <clears throat> the more you, you know, watch House, the more... It does actually explore quite a dangerously depressed person. Because on the surface, he just seems like a bit of a misanthrope. Yeah, exactly. We don't really know much about his private life mm. at the moment. He's just an, he's just at work. He's analysing cases. He's throwing his ball into the air and he's catching it. This is a nice shot, like how he throws the ball up in the air. It's, it's a good touch. It's a good look. And you also get those little eureka moments where he gets primed by another primary character and it makes him think, ah, okay, maybe I can figure this out. Well, that's the thing. I think in the early episodes, and I've noticed this from us watching, is that the eureka moment didn't come like he was, he had an idea when, mm. uh, when Wilson like, you know, said, oh, you know, oh, the pills look the same or whatever it was to make him think about that maybe there was a problem with the medicine itself that the kid was given yeah. but like you then afterwards see house doing research like in the later seasons i especially think that house would just be told that by wilson and immediately come up with the idea and stroll into the room and be like i know the answer but like in this he's like you know he's on the internet I assume he's on web web md whatever it is <laughs> like you know he's looking at the board he's thinking like there's a lot more of those moments where it feels like house is like an intelligent person like he's not just he doesn't just have the superpower of intelligence yeah, it feels like he, uh, you know, is going away and thinking and researching, which is a yeah. which is a really nice touch. I think it makes the like, I don't know, it makes it makes the early episodes quite relaxing. And also, it makes him seem more like a scientist hmm. than this kind of hardcore rationalist who can just deduce it by sheer logic, rather than, you know, it isn't a matter of him just locking in the <laughs> relevant amounts of information into a logical chain he's like okay i need to research this and then come up with a logical chain of reasoning around it yeah absolutely so this is a quite a nice little touch and i'm so it gets lost in the later episodes you say i i think i think so i think it um i mean we'll we'll, we'll discuss it as we get there but i definitely think going on house just comes up with ideas which i can kind of see why because i get why lots of montages of him doing research 
would be quite a strange thing to add in. But House definitely like, you know, he, yeah, he's done research. He's come up with like a theory of why it might be the case. He's like, there's definitely something up with the medicine. He goes away. He looks at like what medicines would interact and what medicines probably like would cause that thing. And he mm. clearly spends like a day or a few hours on it. Whereas yeah. I think in the later episodes, he just knows things like just these crazy things and i think in the earlier episodes they're definitely trying to portray a more realistic like doctor whereas in the later episodes he becomes more of he does, he's not really a doctor he's just doctor house which is some sort of like extra <laughs> subgenre of doctor who just knows everything yeah. and and once again the uh like oh the logical method in the title is being yeah. explored like if I if if I mean I also did philosophy at uni, which is fantastic. But you know if you didn't know what Occam's razor is, I think this episode is extremely well written to not only solve a medical problem but to also explain what Occam's razor is to people. But he also um, um, puts a little Halcyon twist on it and says, uh, you know, the simplest ex explanation is that someone's screwed up. Yeah. Like human human error is the. He puts his little riff on it that it's always about human error, usually as a, you know, the creator of problems. Absolutely. Uh, it's very uh, misanthropic. <laughs> well, that's what they're going for, in case you hadn't noticed. Oh, right. I, I didn't notice. <laughs> it at was all. very subtle. In case you don't notice as well, the mother doesn't like the the lady. Yeah. The um, well, other th the thing is, and as well with the um, Occam's razor thing as well, is that they actually come up with the theory initially that it could be two <clears throat> two rare conditions instead of one impossible condition yeah which is quite another funny twist on the on the on the idea that actually you know the simplest idea can sometimes be that two things happened not just one which yeah. um which is which is nice that the showrunners like understand the concept and are able to play with it enough the world is messy from a causation standpoint and that's kind of what that I think they're going for is like people and you know people are messy disease causation is messy the world is messy and so sometimes it's just not one thing that causes something it's sometimes a multitude of factors quite a very deep um exploration of causation for a prime time tv <laughs> <laughs> um procedural drama absolutely fantastic i i do think houses like deductions are relatively like they're there it, it, I, I don't know if you've seen the earlier seasons of sherlock yeah but i think like um there's quite a good sketch one of the few good sketches that he's ever done uh i can't even remember his name he has a really terrible late night show uh but he does a uh, a sketch of how uh sherlock holmes like deduces something and then people go well no it's actually this because yeah. the problem with deduction is that it's never 100% certain. But I do think that House's deductions are relatively on point, or at least he like never says something explicitly. He's like within a ballpark. Yeah. Um, which is kind of demonstrated with the medicine thing. Like he gets the medicine aspect right, but then there's enough evidence to refute the rest. But then because he got the medicine, her giving him the cough medicine, he's like, right, well, I must be on something. That couldn't have just been a coincidence. Mm. And I think that... Um, yeah, like House isn't just saying things and they're being true. Mm. He's uh, like is talking logically to an extent, which I think the show does very well. Like he doesn't feel like the new Sherlock Holmes where he just says things and they're just true, like jumps to insane conclusions where the evidence could mean several things. Yeah, that is true. And is this the big reveal? Uh, yep. yep. He's figuring it out. All solved. It's just ripping hair out of his head and saying, oh, it's hair loss. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing, like, this is the point where, and, like, House has been so confident at each point. This is the point where he just walks into an ICU and just goes, yeah, I'm probably right. Like, Yeah, it's like, I'm infallible now. Yeah. I've got the I've got the shield of House deduction <laughs> around me, protecting me. Because yeah. he, he's such a, like, uh, they. Uh, I think it's Hugh Laurie's performance that pulls it off, but for someone who's so, like, 
quiet and doesn't like talking to anyone. He just has such an insane flair for the dramatic, which I know is also to make it a more interesting show, yeah. to make House more interesting. But for a man who like doesn't really like talking to anyone, and seems to be like enjoy being left alone to like think. Mm. He will then just confidently, as this insane extrovert, just walk in, potentially kill the patient when he could just say, oh, you know, we could run a test. Yeah. Rather than this insane demonstration of his knowledge and skill. <laughs> um, but I think that's probably the David Shaw's kind of legalistic um, experience where, you know, there's a need to rhetorically and physically instantiate your correct procedure in front of people to convince them that's like his closing and, statement and i guess i guess in a way that's kind of in a way that's a similarity between medicine and kind of the law is that you have to demonstrate with a certain degree of confidence in order to inspire your patients to allow you to take risks and um you know, get the job done. Mm. Otherwise, it'd be like, mm, okay, if they go, oh, probabilistically, you might this, that, and the other. It's like, oh, I don't don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> Got to have, like, a bit of confidence. <laughs> so, in the same way as trying to convince a judge um, of something, you have to convince the patient of something so that they will go ahead with it or agree with it. I mean, it's, it's an not just it's an right is might. It's... <laughs> kind of there's a need to use might to be right i mean it is an interesting analysis of david shaw because i didn't know he was a lawyer before this and the more that you bring it up the more convinced i am <laughs> that, it, that, it, that, it, that it affects him because that's a very yeah. good point like there are these dramatic like closing closing like arguments in each one in each episode yeah i think it also accounts for the economy of um the writing and also the f also in comp with the dramatic flair is a very kind of straightforward logical jump between plot points mm. and it will kind of tie up neatly together in a closing statement that convinces you that yeah house is a pretty good doctor <laughs> and he's got a good team what are they going to do next week what challenges are they going to confront next time yeah and this is still within the realms of house does crazy things, but they're like they're reasonable. Yeah. I do think to keep the show exciting, they do get slowly more insane. But we'll we'll explore those, and I very much look forward to you seeing those. And hey, you oh, can you can decide whether or not that that's the show jumping the shark as well, because you know maybe it's just natural character development. The house would just become more insane. <laughs> The well, he seems get. a bit insane at the moment. He's now doing a comparative analysis of all of the variations of one drug <laughs> in a chemist that seems to have loads of them for some reason. He's found it. He's done it. He's yeah. proved it. Independent of the case, the person's well, but he still goes ahead, ahead hmm. goes ahead with it and goes through and looks through every single thing just to see how right he was or yeah. that he was right. Which kind of introduces a bit of uncertainty about his own method, like how much of it he wasn't a hundred percent sure in a sense. He still needed to have that independent ver verification. It wasn't a done deal that that was the case. It just happened to be. Yeah, that's scary. But it, <laughs> well, it's uh, it's a good moment of characterization as well because it doesn't just show that House cures him and is happy. It's this him sitting there for hours afterwards. Like the yeah. the case isn't really important. Uh, I mean, it obviously this is the early the early um the early series where they're trying to establish everything, but the fact that they do demonstrate the house isn't just happy that everything was resolved. He needs to know why he needs to be right. It's a, it's a very like succinct way of showing that. It's not just yeah. ha house doesn't even say anything about it. He doesn't like go oh but I'm unsatisfied because I do not know the answer. Like, just the fact that he's carrying out that, you kind of immediately see, oh, I get this guy. And mm. um, it's just like another example of the earlier seasons, like, just doing that really well. Mm. Like, it really does establish, like, th this guy in a very, like, interesting, like, way that isn't just people talking and explaining what they're thinking. 
Mm. I think a lot of people would be satisfied with just the, res the resolution of the human story, which is the person is killed, hooray, and that's the end of it. Mm. Um, there's this kind of obs weird obsessiveness about the problem, the case, the case independent of the humans. It's like the humans are just um, don't factor in as strongly as you would think yeah. for a doctor. Which is interesting. Yeah. But well, yeah. It's incredibly unique. I think... Um, sorry, guys. What, what were you going to say as your, your closing statement? Oh, no, my closing statement is... What a jolly good episode. Even if the establishing shot was absurd as it was grotesque. Mm. Um, with <laughs> a, a sandstone, sand or limestone building physically shaking <laughs> during coitus. Well, yeah, well, I really enjoyed watching that with you. Thank you very much. That was a really the pleasure. Was a really... Is all mine. Oh, I'm talking just about the sex scene specifically. Okay. Yes. Um, it was <laughs> it's an eye opener. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, I mean, yeah, we'll 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 uh, a lot of the episodes are going to be formulaic, and maybe we won't have anything to talk about. But the early episodes, especially, I think there is like something something to claw into. That they're definitely they're establishing. They're, they're establishing everything really well. And yes. um, it'll be interesting to see how, like, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what, which characters do you think haven't really been set in stone yet? I think Foreman, House, and Cuddy are pretty much there. I, I, I do mm. think the rest of the team are like they've done things, but I don't think that they're like why they're interesting is there yet. Yeah, Cuddy, I can see she's kind of like the hard boiled, uh, not hard boiled, but she's like the. Um, police chief in a you know noir uh, film noir <laughs> classic she's always kind of straight to the edge by the book you don't do it house you're in trouble big trouble mm. um but i don't know i want to see if there i i don't want to cast any set in stone judgments i just don't know these characters intimately enough in comparison to you so i'd say yeah, Cuddy's trope is established, but whatever's beyond the surface, I haven't seen yet. Um, but that remains to be seen. We're oh. only three episodes in. I know it's incredible. I think I think she's a bit beyond her trope, though. That that's what I quite that's what that's what I mean okay. more about that. Like, you know, like Wilson, Wilson is the trope of a nice man, but I think Cuddy is that police chief character. But the fact that she plays into the game. Okay. Like yeah. is, is is a bit of an extra element. I can see why she's interesting. And you can understand that Foreman doesn't want to be like House, but at the same time he's kind of becoming that. And then yeah. House obviously has had all of the a, any interesting characterization they could come up with they've thrown at House. So I think yeah. those characters are like they're tropes, but they have like a small twist on them. Yeah. Which makes them slightly more interesting and stand out. Yeah. That's fair enough. I think that's um good analysis. I I'd say the characters that have been least developed, I think in my opinion is Wilson and Cameron. It seems like um apart from Cameron being awkward around patients and saying weird shit all the time and <laughs> Wilson just going, Here's a case that I found. Would you like to try it out, Mr House? I mean Doctor House. <laughs> I found it outside in the bin. <laughs> nothing nothing crazy about this you might have found it interesting <laughs> so, yeah. no yeah I, I'd, I'd agree with that i think okay. uh, and you know what i'm being i'm being unfair on camera and i think she's like she she do, she does i think the you know there's the sex relationship thing although very clunky is like it, it demonstrates that she has some depth and that she's like willing to go against her better nature okay okay yeah um and be a bit, yeah. But we'll see what happens in the next episode, which is called Maternity. Now, if you haven't watched the previous episode, is it episode two? Yes. That's called Paternity. Oh. <laughs> Incredible. Thinking ahead yeah. there. So I would... Um, by David. Good old David. <laughs> well, I'd suggest um, any, anybody, like if anybody has an interest in continuing to listen to this, I would, I would definitely watch... Watch the episode ahead of time. Just get a refresher, and then, hey, what, what you know? Just listen to what we have to say. Th think on it. Let us know what you think. If you have any uh, differences of opinion, 
But um, it, I mean, it, hey, it's an excuse to watch House again week on week as it was as aired. they say, as they say, like, share and prescribe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what format we're on. So do uh, do whatever, whatever the equivalent of those are. All right. Well, um, yeah. So thank you for listening to this. Thanks to Gaz. Yeah. All the thank you very much for having me, Harvey, on That's your fine. podcast. Well, it's our podcast. Oh, our I'm just podcast saying thanks. Now. I'm saying Ooh. thanks for just being involved. Oh, that's very nice of you. Um, I wish I could say the same. You could. <laughs> yeah, you could. I could. <laughs> but the misanthropy is rubbing off, so I won't. I've got to hide those feelings deep inside. <laughs> well, thank you very much for watching the podcast. We'll see you next week with episode four, Maternity, which will still be 15 years after the fact, too late. <laughs>